observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Marvel is probably never going to do a movie as dour as Logan. Probably never as cool as Logan, because I love Logan. It's great. What the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing is making four-quadrant entertainment family entertainment that's still relatively sophisticated. And my favorite thing about the MCU is it embraces the entire comic book nature of all of it. I love it. I mean, it's like what it was like to be a fan of the comics. It's telling this ongoing story, and yet the funny thing about it is people are always trying to criticize the comics. They don't like the fact that they've been adapted in certain ways and everybody's wondering or, or complaining. And I would say, look, and now I can hear the, the, the chorus of, Rob Burnett is a Disney shill. No, I just like Marvel Comics. And I think what Kevin Feige and Victoria Alonso and Louis Esposito have been doing over there with their incredibly talented teams of people that are making these movies is unprecedented in Hollywood history. And it makes it makes me, there's been, what, 28 Marvel movies now? Or, or Doctor Strange is the 28th Marvel movie. Let's say Black Widow was 24, Shang-Chi was 25, Eternals was 26, Spider-Man No Way Home was 27, so indeed Doctor Strange is 28. 28 films. And I believe, judging by Spider-Man No Way Home's box office, I believe if you average out the box office of all 27 movies currently, they still average out to each movie made a billion dollars. Now, I can't tell you, n there's nothing like that in the history of Hollywood, even adjusted for inflation. And clearly, I'm not the only one who loves Marvel movies, and I think their level of quality is rivaled only by Pixar in terms of its consistency in delivering the kind of entertainment that they set out to make. Marvel has not set out to do something and failed yet. I mean, people can point to movies that are less, say, than successful. Perhaps Thor The Dark World was didn't quite gel. Iron Man 2, people talk about that not being very good. But have you watched it lately? It's pretty good. It's fun. Ed Norton is the Hulk, you know. Even that, very diverting compared to a lot of other movies I've seen. But anyway, back to this article. Back to this article. This article, it's a think piece. Uh, I, whenever I say that, I think of Ben Fong Torres in Almost Famous. And when uh, when our, our humble narrator and, and characters repeating back what the amazing Lester Banks told him, he'll wet himself. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> As I cough, sorry for anybody listening to the audio version of this. Mm. So here's this article. Will the Batman force Marvel into changing for the better? I hope so. Look at this, right out of the gate. Marvel changing for the better. See, the funny thing about that is, is does Marvel need to change? If Kevin Feige were to read this article, would he say, hmm, looking at the latest box office returns coming in or the pre-sales of Spider-Man No Way Home, do, do we have to change? I mean, do we? Anyway. Let's see what Emma Garland has to say for Esquire magazine. Superhero films have dominated cinema for over a decade. You can rock up to an Odeon at any given time, safe in the knowledge that you'll be able to chug an ice blast and watch an actor called Chris save the world with his massive arms. That's comforting, in a way reliable. Like a morning ritual or a Tesco meal deal, outside of their diehard fan bases, though, Audiences are becoming bored and more openly critical of the Marvel monoculture. Now, here's what I don't here's what I don't understand. This article that's in Esquire, which I've enjoyed reading most of my life, Esquire, audiences are becoming bored and more openly critical of Marvel monoculture. But th she makes this statement, Emma. Where's the evidence of that? At least follow that up with something. Give me an example of who is bored and who is more openly critical. I know us YouTube pundits are pretty openly critical, but but where is your uh, where is your evidence that anyone's bored? Anyway, I won't editorialize. I'll just keep reading this article. It's common knowledge at this point that superhero franchises start filming their CGI scenes years in advance, sometimes before casting, and then construct the rest of the production around them. That is true. There's a lot of the Marvel visual development departments come up with fight scenes and action sequences that they're going to put into their stories. But I would, I would ask you, 
most big effect sequences in any movie, they start, I mean, maybe not before casting, but they start early because they have to. Um, and then construct the rest of the production around them. Marvel's fight scenes are disconnected and choppy, cutting to a different frame every second. An, a different frame every second? An arm pulling back to throw a punch one second, a close-up of their fist hitting someone's jaw the next, uh, which is true. While DC tends to go for color grading so dark that it absorbs absorbs half the detail. Uh, did you see Shazam? Did you see Suicide Squad? The Suicide Squad. Um, the dialogue is typically front-loaded with clinical or obvious detail about what's going on, peppered with WWE-type trash talk and comedic one-liners. None of this is to say that they're bad films. At the very least, you know what you're getting. 120 minutes of well-made, popcorn-friendly action. But the more they're churned out, the more formulaic and dispassionate they feel. And when they make up the majority of what's in on, on in cinemas, it inevitably narrows the parameters of pop culture. That I agree with, Emma. I agree wholeheartedly that when the majority of films that the studios are making and what, what they put in cinemas, it does narrow the parameters of pop culture. Wholeheartedly agree with that. Famously, Martin Scorsese said as much in a 2019 interview with Empire when he compared the MCU franchise to a theme park. After some backlash, he clarified the point in an op-ed for the New York Times. For me, he says, Martin, Martin says, cinema was about revelation, aesthetic, emotional, and spiritual revelation, he writes. It was about characters, the complexity of people and their contradictory and sometimes paradoxical natures, the way... They can hurt one another and love one another and suddenly come face to face with themselves. Obviously, you could argue that this is true of films like The Avengers, just as you could argue that some of Hitchcock's classics could equally be described as theme parks. Really? But it's overwhelmingly the case that superhero films prioritize special effects and soundtracks that heavily feature that noise that goes boom over emotional substance or aesthetics. Okay, I again, I really dislike these articles. There's a there's a good point to be made here. But comparing and contrasting and saying things that these like these movies prioritize special effects, they absolutely do not. And neither does the MCU prioritize effects over uh, uh and soundtracks over emotional substance or aesthetics. In fact, I would argue that the reason that the MCU is as successful as it is is because the characters are so rich and well-drawn, played by actors that make you believe in them. You know, one of my favorite scenes in Avengers Endgame is when Cap talks to Natasha and they have that conversation about what the world is like after the blip, after half the population of the universe has been blipped away by Thanos. It's just the two of them talking. Now, in what two-hour superhero movie that wasn't part of a big, larger franchise would you spend that much screen time having Captain America and Black Widow talk to each other without throwing punches? The reason the Marvel Cinematic Universe works is because we love those characters. We love them. And the actors that they've chosen to inhabit those characters are brilliant and perfect in what they do. Paul Rudd as Ant-Man. Chris Evans as Captain America. Chris Hemsworth as Thor. Go let, look at Guardians of the Galaxy. Look at that. Look at Chris Hemsworth. Uh, I mean, Chris Pratt playing Star-Lord, who's now going to act with Chris Hemsworth. And the, the interplay of the two of them, I have no doubt, will be delightful because we've already seen it be delightful and fun. These movies are wildly entertaining, and they actually wildly succeed at what they are trying to do. Marvel movies are not swinging and missing. They're doing all kinds of crazy things, and the, it, it, the fact that all of it works, I didn't think that Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor would ever work together into some kind of cohesive whole, much less build up to an Avengers movie. I, I was like, how are you going to do that? The first Iron Man movie is, is fairly grounded. And it's the story of one man and one man's sort of come to Jesus moment. And then 
you know, then you're seeing Thor and you're seeing Asgard and the Rainbow Bridge and the Warriors 3 and Odin and Loki and Heimdall. I mean, you're seeing all of it. And somehow, Iron Man and Thor can exist in the same universe. It, it, it worked spectacularly well. Uh, we're getting our 28th Marvel movie in May and people such as myself are in a lather about it. What's going to happen? Uh, and I, I just, these think pieces about, well, what's wrong with Marvel? Anyway, let's, let's go on and read this article. Now, I agree. I, I, I always talk about on this show that I love my Antonioni Ennui trilogy of movies. I love all that jazz, one of my favorite films of all time. I love All About Eve. I love Sunset Boulevard. I love Vertigo. I love Almost Famous. I love Ingmar Bergman movies. I love Fellini films. I love Kurosawa. You know, I love films from all over the world. Unfortunately, the world that we live in has changed, and our entertainment is both reflecting and shaping who we are as people. And um, I do think our whole culture has been, to a certain degree, infantilized. I mean, look at me. I'm an old man with graying hair. Some would say white and I'm still here talking about comic book movies when I should be thinking about retiring. But I'm not going to. Because if one thing uh, that I can tell you about all of these flights of fancy and what it means to be an imagination connoisseur is it there's so much around us that keep us happy and having a good time. And uh, there's if, if you don't like one thing, there's something over there. It's delightful. Now, we are in a state where a lot of our the things that we love have now been sucked up by larger corporations. So the reason something exists is no longer because creators had a story to tell. It, it It's now happening because corporations have to perpetuate these IPs in the hope of making money, which is odd because one day the, the corporations are going to figure out that, you know what, what we need in order to make these IPs work is we all need Kevin Feige's to run these. these. I mean, the thing about Star Trek is, sure, it's all under the auspices of, of, of Secret Hideout and Alex Kurtzman. But there's no there are no visionary people running the Star Trek franchise, so it's being run into the ground. And the people that are the people over there that are making Mike Mike over there doing lower decks or the team doing Prodigy, they're not doing anything remotely similar to what they're doing over on Discovery or Picard or Strange New Worlds. There is no singular vision that is behind all of these. And I think the people telling the stories are unqualified to do so, but that's a rant that I, you know, I had to stick it in here. You knew it was coming. But in terms of what Marvel is doing, this article is, is uh, look, I get it. I would love everyone to watch film noir. I would love the fact that people all around the world would be like, oh my God, Criterion's releasing Double Indemnity in 4K. I gotta get that. Unfortunately, that was a movie that came out in the 40s and no one knows what that movie is now. Remember, I always say on the show, pop culture has a half-life of 20 years, and then it sort of fades into obscurity for, for the general population, not the fan base. And why should it? Why should it last? Entertainment is entertainment. It's in one ear and out the other. We care about it. I care about it. I love the art of filmmaking. I've made it my chosen profession, and I have been a critic and pundit for 25 years professionally, whether I was appearing on Sci-Fi Vortex on the Sci-Fi Channel with Blind Date's Roger Lodge, or I was the critic at large for Sci-Fi Universe magazine, published by Larry Flint. So I've been talking about these things professionally for a very long time. My first column was in my high school newspaper, real life. Um, so it's not like I haven't not been paying attention. I get it. I understand. But anyway, let's... Perhaps Scorsese's comments shamed big studios into taking more risks. Perhaps audiences are showing a greater demand for range. It's significant that independent companies like A24 have risen to prominence as this exhaustion sets in, but it feels like we might be hitting a turning point for superhero films. The conversation around them is often reduced to blanket statements arguing the case for them being good or bad, but the third and more interesting option is to push the envelope of what they could be, which I agree. I agree. Joker was a stab at that and clearly Matt Reeves the Batman is also going to be a stab at that 
Over the last few years, there have been several examples of superhero films becoming more ambitious and experimental. The first was 2018's Into the Spider-Verse, a genuinely innovative and moving film completely unlike any other take on Spider-Man or the modern animated blockbuster. Last year's The Suicide Squad was also a deviation from the DC norm, following their usual pace and format, but making room for more character depth and using the budget to push the boat out on visuals. See Margot Robbie diving into an alien eye full of rats. And most recently, we have Matt Reeves' much-anticipated The Batman. For all intents and purposes, The Batman is a cult film smuggled to a global audience under a blockbuster name. Is it, though? From the costume design, the 2022 Batsuit features blood stains, bullet marks, and general wear and tear, to the choice of soundtrack, an orchestral remake of Nirvana's Something in the Way, to the way Reeves and members of the cast have spoken about it, it's an intentional subversion of Batman's traditionally aloof heroism. Have you read Batman comics? There's as many different iterations of the Batman as there are colors of the rainbow. Or as many people might say, genders. There's a lot of Batman out there. A lot of different kinds of Batman. And we haven't seen that many of them in or up on the big screen. Robert Pattinson, never one to play a normal character, has described his interpretation of Bruce Wayne as a guy who has no idea of who he is and no reason to live. Far from assuming a heroic identity as a force for good by night, the identity is a crutch of its own, a way of coping with life following the death of his parents. As far as origin stories go, Todd Phillips' The Joker, or just Joker, took much of the same approach, although it pulled Joker out of the comic book universe and into the realm of psychological thriller. While several films have been dedicated to the villain origin story, very rarely do we get into the psychology of the hero beyond something sad happened to them in childhood. This interrogation of vigilante heroism, in many ways just as worrying as villainy, that one bad day away sentiment has been written into the arc of the Joker from day one for a reason, is a welcome shift in gears. Obviously, the DC universe has always been dark, visually and emotionally. Uh, you mean the films, obviously, because clearly the comics. The DC universe hasn't always been dark. Look at the 66 Batman television series, of which Spawn spawned a feature film. But the way the Batman is packaged has more in common with 90s cult staples like The Matrix, Fight Club, or The Crow, or Seven or Zodiac, than it does a modern superhero film. But it is a modern superhero film. It is a filmmaker in Matt Reeves who already worked in a franchise with Planet of the Apes and also remade Let the Right One In. So it's not like the studios said, oh, I think we should go in a different direction. They made Joker, and now they're making The Batman. Judging by what we've heard so far, it looks to steer the narrative away from the objective good versus objective evil and into something more vulnerable and nuanced, something that, as Scorsese would put it, explores the complexity of human nature. Regardless of whether the Batman matches expectation, that's a welcome shift. If superhero films are set to continue their domination of the box office, their future is in the details. Now, I would say, you know, first of all, it bothers me that there are no real examples in this article. And I feel like a lot of these think piece articles are being written by people that are just watching others, other YouTube videos and sort of, in a way, parroting back what people are saying. Um, there's a long tradition of, remember, Batman and Superman have been around, there was a, a Batman serial in the 1940s on the big screen. The Adventures of Captain Marvel, the Superman TV series from the 50s. It's not like these characters suddenly came out of nowhere and dominated our screens. Now, who would have thought the world that we live in would have uh, its cinema screens dominated the way they are dominated by superhero movies now? But remember, I mean, superhero films, superheroes are just cops or knights in shining armor or lawyers or reporters like Woodward and Bernstein trying to do good, trying to save the world. But I think what's really interesting is superhero movies are fun. There's a reason why people are liking them. And also, they're being embraced by audiences that have grown up with these characters since they were kids. There's been superhero stuff on TV almost nonstop for the last 45 years. 